So thank you everybody for joining this morning. Uh, I'm Jed Bradley, Director of OPB's Policy Planning and State Operations team. Uh, this is normally a great time to meet some of you in person, but unfortunately here we are in our second virtual kickoff. Hopefully next year we can get back to our uh, cookies and vats of coffee, but it'll have to wait for now. Uh, either way, thanks in advance for your partnership during session. We really appreciate it. We couldn't do this work without all of you. See a lot of familiar and some not familiar faces. So thank you for joining us this morning. A couple quick housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, this presentation is being recorded for those folks who uh, can't make it. So we'll post that on the OPB webpage after the event. Uh, please either raise your hand or put questions in the chat during the presentations. We'll answer any questions uh, on the fly or after each section, and then we will definitely open up at the end for any Q&A. And then I also want to mention that we are uh, holding a Q&A session next Friday at 1 p.m. If you have any more questions, it'll be a smaller group. Um, and details for that were in my reminder email, but let me know if you didn't get that. So here is our uh, team in OPB that you'll be hearing from this year. A few kind of quick notes about our role during legislative session. We'll produce budget briefs for any major budget proposals. Um, we'll talk more about that later. We track all bills relevant to the UW uh, and coordinate efforts with state relations to respond to those bills. We review every bill introduced at the legislature um, every day. So you'll be hearing from us if we uh, think a bill might impact the university to see if you um, need to track it on behalf of the UW. We also coordinate responses to fiscal note requests from the legislature. So we, we should get uh, somewhere between 100 and 150 of those this session. Um, and we might reach out to you for those. And then we respond to a wide range of data and policy inquiries from state relations, the legislature, UW administration, and others throughout the course of session. So uh, we might be in touch with you for any number of those things and thanks in advance. A quick overview of our uh, specific roles in OPB. I'll be the primary contact for our team for any general questions. Happy to point you to the right person if you don't know who to contact. Kelsey is our primary contact for capital budget proposals and our primary contact for fiscal notes. And she'll also be helping with uh, bill tracking and information requests. Lauren is our primary contact for the operating budget and for bill tracking. Uh, she'll be reviewing house bills this year and helping with fiscal notes and information requests. So any lobby gov questions can go directly to Lauren. She's our resident expert on that. Charlotte will be reviewing and tracking Senate bills uh, and helping with fiscal notes and info requests. And then Zara, our new graduate student intern, will be maintaining LobbyGov, sending bill updates, uh, and helping with info requests as well. So we're thrilled to have Charlotte and Zara join us. Uh, Charlotte's our newest policy analyst, and Zara's our intern this year. Normally, I'd have them stand up and wave, but uh, I'll ask them to do a little Zoom wave right now. And obviously, here are some very nice pictures of them as well. Uh, and we always update you all on our uh, session support animals. So Charlotte brought on Zuzu, Zara brought on Manu, and I added Monty. So very important for our work uh, to be successful to have our, our support here. So with that, I will uh, pass it off to Lauren, who will talk about bill tracking and lobby gov. Thanks, Jen. Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm Lauren Hashin. I'm a policy analyst in the Office of Planning and Budgeting. Um, and as Jed said, thank you for being here and for all your help during previous sessions and for the support I know you're going to provide this this year. My first legislative session was in 2018, actually when I interned for OPB, and I'm so grateful to all the folks that I've worked with and those that have helped our team with what seems like a never ending rush of bills and fiscal notes. So thank you again. Uh, if you can believe it, I'm going to provide a quick overview of the legislative process bill tracking and analysis, and our bill tracking platform, LobbyGov. And I'll also direct you to a few website re resources along the way. So why does this matter? Legislative decisions impact higher education policy, UW operations, healthcare policy, and so many other things. Bill tracking and analysis provides a crucial opportunity to provide feedback on policies that will affect the UW. And it's critical that the experts in the room or on Zoom have a say in these decisions in order to ensure that they have the desired effect, that they're implementable by the UW and they benefit our UW community. So let's get started with a few important terms that I'll be using throughout the presentation and terms that you may hear during the legislative session. House of origin or first house 
This is the chamber in which a piece of legislation originates. It can be in the House or the Senate. Opposite House or Second House is the second chamber through which a piece of legislation moves. Substitute bill, which can be abbreviated as SSB or SHB, is the new version of a bill that completely replaces the original bill. Striking amendment or striker is an amendment that removes everyth everything but the title and inserts an entirely new bill. Engrossed is legislation into which one or more amendments have been incorporated and it has passed the chamber. So a quick run through the legislative process. Uh, we start with a bill introduction that's either introduced in the Senate or the House by a member, and it's then referred to a committee. The committee then reads the bill and may decide to hold a public hearing, which is essentially an opportunity for stakeholders to voice support or concerns. This is when someone from state relations or a campus expert is most likely to provide feedback. The committee can then hold an executive session, which is when they vote to pass, reject, or amend a bill. If passed, the bill may go to the floor for a vote. And at this point, the full membership of the House or the Senate can choose to pass, reject, or amend it. After passing the House of Origin, the bill goes through the same procedure in the opposite house and we essentially restart the process. I'm not gonna go through that again, so don't worry. Um, if the amendments are made in the if their amendments made in the opposite house, the House of Origin must approve the changes in order or work to reconcile. When the bill is accepted in both houses, the governor signs the bill into law or may veto all or part of it. Your timely assessments are absolutely essential to this process. Our team reviews assessments and uses information that you provide to determine what the best way is to move forward. If, we, if you ever have feedback that you don't feel comfortable putting in LobbyGov or submitting via email, feel free to call any member of our team. Now that we've got the basics down, we're ready to analyze legislation. The first step, no surprise, is to read the bill. If you're working with an analyst on our team, we always include a direct link to the bill's homepage on the legislature's website. The homepage looks something like this and provides a fair amount of information free to explore, but the actual bill text can be found closer to the bottom of the page. So scroll down. At the bottom of the homepage, you'll see the available document section. Under bill documents, you'll see a variety of bill versions. Please make sure you're reading the correct version, which will be the last one in the list. Again, it's important, um, oh yeah, again, it's important that you're reading current version. <laughs> The bill report section can be helpful as it provides comprehensive summary of background and effect statements of bills, which are prepared by committee staff. Please note that reading um, bill reports while helpful is not a substitute for reading actual bill text. Assuming that we've clicked on the current version of the bill, we're on to the fun part, reading the bill. Unfortunately, this is only an example of a bill that would change the state seal of Washington and replaced General George Washington with the beloved UW mascot, Dubs. As you're reading bills, please keep an eye out for the following markers. New sections will be underlined. This indicates that the language in this section is entirely new, so please read the entire section very carefully. You also wanna keep an eye out for struck out text, which indicates that the language is being removed from existing code and underlined text, which indicates that new language is being added to the code. So in this example, General George Washington is struck and dubs the Husky is added. I think, and I hope you do as well, this is important for the university to come out in strong support of this bill. When you're reading bills, please read carefully so we don't miss out on anything important um, like this one. Now, if we wanted to document our strong support for changing the state seal to dubs and alert OPB and the state relations team with our feedback, we want to do this in LobbyGov. Many of you are probably familiar with LobbyGov, but as a quick refresher, LobbyGov is a platform used extensively in bill analysis and legislative affairs in our state. LobbyGov notifies OPB when a tracked bill has a hearing, when it's amended, and when it moves. 
Additionally, LobbyGov enables stakeholders across the university to assess legislation throughout the process. University stakeholders who have been asked to review legislation can access LobbyGov at uw.lobbygov.com using your UWNet ID to log in. You may need to select the SAMA login if you're not automatically redirected. And if you have any issues or if you need a user account, please contact anyone on our team, but it's probably gonna be me. If you are assigned a bill in LobbyGov, you'll receive the following email that is definitely legit, not spam, although it does look a little spammy. This email will notify you that you have a new bill assignment and you can log into LobbyGov directly from this email. If for some reason you missed the email or forget to provide an assessment, we will email you a few days before your bill has a public hearing with a very gentle reminder to provide feedback in LobbyGov. After you log into LobbyGov with your UWNet ID, you'll see this page. In LobbyGov, the to-do list shows any bills that are pending review. Make sure you're viewing the 67th session, which will show you bills from the first and second halves of the biennium. Bills that were introduced in the 2021 session but did not pass can resurface during the 2022 session. This shows me from left to right that House Bill 1736 has been assigned there's no companion bill. Uh, the bill status indicates that it is pre-filed. I can see uh, the abbreviated title for quick reference. And most importantly, I can also see when my, well, I guess you can't see this, one. it's very tiny, but it's very important to note when your bill review is due. This one is due on the 10th. To provide analysis on House Bill 1736, I simply click review bill. After selecting review bill, you'll see this page. In the top left-hand corner, you can select legislature bill page um, and read the bill to review any documents like bill reports or amendments. You can also see if other departments are assigned to the bill and read any analysis that they may have provided. For example, OPB is also assigned to this bill. After reviewing the bill, and perhaps what other departments have said about the bill, you should first determine if the bill impacts the university or if the bill is misassigned. Selecting misassigned will kick the bill back to OPB to determine if the bill should be assigned to a different department. If the bill does not impact your area, feel free to indicate that um, it doesn't impact UW. Beyond the initial review questions, there are three assessment questions, which are, please assess the impact of this bill on the UW, do you have any suggested amendments for this bill, and what outcomes, positive or negative, do you anticipate that the bill will have for BIPOC students, staff, faculty, community members, and vulnerable communities? At the bottom of the bill review page, you'll be asked to recommend a position and priority. Our team is most interested in bills that are marked as high priority, um, these bills have significant positive or negative impact on the university and, and necessitate the highest level of attention by our team and the state relations team. The physical impact is greater or uh, creates a deficit of more than a million dollars. So typically bills that we see don't fall in that category. They fall in the medium monitoring or low priority um, levels. You can find guidance for selecting a position and priority on our bill tracking and legislative resources page, and I'll show you that later. Once complete, please select yes, and then press save, and that's it, you've completed your bill review. So what makes a good assessment? A helpful assessment provides a detailed summary on what the bill does and how it changes current policy. It summarizes how the change would affect the UW and it recommends a position and priority. Just as an FYI, um, we will share this presentation on our website. So if you do wanna read this example, you can. This is an actual assessment that a reviewer offered. And it's an example that we found to be extremely effective in conveying the impact this bill would have on the UW. By contrast, here's a less helpful assessment that full disclosure I wrote, or I guess didn't write. Um, while we do appreciate brevity, this assessment is too short and does not provide an explanation of, on the impact of the bill. 
It indicates concern and recommends a high priority, but it does not detail what the concerns are. It also does not offer any amendments to alleviate the concerns, and it doesn't offer any helpful rationale for opposition. If you do write an assessment like this, you are probably gonna get a call from our office asking for more details. So when you're reviewing bills, please ask yourself, what does the bill add or remove from existing law? Does the bill have a fiscal, programmatic, or operational impact? What amendments would you recommend? Again, you are the experts in your field and your explanation of feasibility and specific impacts of a proposed bill truly steer if and how state relations approaches it in Olympia. In general, please remember to be clear and concise. Note any areas of confusion, provide some education. Sometimes when legislators need, um, sometimes legislators need some education regarding activities we already do um, or it already exists. So if it's clear that the legislator who wrote the bill doesn't really understand what we do, um, it's good to let us know that and we'll try to communicate that in Olympia. Also give us a sense of importance and scale. Pay attention to the version of the bill you're responding to. And most importantly, please, please respond as soon as you receive an email from us. Um, yeah, I think that's the most important thing. Oh, also remember that generally um, assessments, while they're private, um, generally, are viewed by a small group of people and they are subject to public record request. If you have any questions or run into any issues, please feel free to reach out to anyone on our team. And as I previously mentioned, we have many resources on our tracking and legislative resources page, which can be found on our website. And yeah, that is all I have. Does anyone have any questions? I don't see any hands or chat, so. Great. Um, anyway. Oh, hi, Helen. Hi, this is Helen Garrett, University Registrar. Sorry for the late entry there. Um, I, I do have a question and I'm not sure quite how you'll answer this, but when we're reviewing a bill and there's something that, you know, we weigh in and say what we think about the impact, but we think that it could have a, a larger global impact, perhaps at the, the highest level of administration that the university might want to pay attention to. What would you suggest to us in those moments? So, you know, especially when we're doing a fiscal note and, and weighing in, um, you know, I think of the residency, um, the Senate Bill 5194 last year. So as, as we're out there down at our level reviewing this, I, I'm making assumptions that if this could have a grander impact to the, the financial wellness of the university that upper administration is seeing it. But do you want us to, do you think we're, we should flag our our managers, do we, should we put notes to that effect or what advice might you have when we think there could be even a grander implication beyond what might be our own units? Yeah, great question, Helen. I would say, you know, let us know, make that clear in your lobby of assessment. Also, if, if it's really urgent or you think it could be interpreted in a way, for example, the bill that you, you reference, you know, let us know on the side, send us a quick email. You know, it doesn't hurt to tell your, you, you know, your leadership, um, and make sure that you know all all folks that need to know are apprised of that. And you know there are there are a certain number of bills that we keep the president and provost directly updated on. Um, and so some things definitely rise to that level. Yeah, That's and the only thing, thank you, Jed. The only thing I would advise colleagues is um, I don't know what your professional term for this, but sometimes something can be buried into what might look like unicorns and joy and a wonderful bill that could have ramifications, it's like tucked down at the end. And I know that that uh, we, we did our best to, to flag that, but it's really important that you are watching for those kind of sneaker waves um, in case the fabulous folks at OPB aren't also seeing that. So I, I know I'm gonna, I'm gonna be even, um, have a deeper level of scrutiny in this next session than I did in the past to try to watch for something that may be way down below that isn't really what you think the, the bill is about, so. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, somebody asked uh, in the chat to me, um, 
I have a question. There's often context, political or otherwise, that underlies a bill that is not obvious from just reading the bill. How can we uh, best get any background that gives us a better idea of why it was introduced? That's a that's a great question. Um, sometimes we know that. Sometimes Joe and team know that. Uh, in some cases we can ask, but in many cases they don't tell us. <laughs> so we we aren't often told kind of who sponsored some something or whose idea something was. So um, we can do our best to try to track that down. Feel free to ask if you if you think there might be kind of a. a bigger issue going on or or you want to know kind of the genesis of some idea we can we can try to track that down joe anything to add to that no i, th I think that's accurate normally there's there is more going on and we can do some sleuthing on that all right i think that's it for this uh kelsey take it away oh i was gonna pass it off to kelsey but you great job jed <laughs> Uh, uh, thanks, everyone. So, hi, I'm Kelsey Rowe. I'm the Senior Policy Analyst on the Policy Planning and State Operations Team. And once again, I will be heading up fiscal notes for this year. So, what is a fiscal note? So, a fiscal note is an estimate of a bill's fiscal impact. This is separate from the general policy review, advocacy, and bill assessment that Lauren was just talking about that you do in Lobby Gov. Fiscal notes are just for fiscal impact. So a fiscal note shows how a bill would fiscally impact the UW over six or sometimes 10 years. It must be based on the least expensive way to reasonably implement the bill. It's always tied to a specific version of the bill. So each time a bill is revised and we have a substitute, second substitute, et cetera, we get a new fiscal note request. Uh, fiscal notes help legislators evaluate a bill's costs and merits before deciding whether to pass, reject, or amend it. And they inform legislative staff, journalists, lobbyists, and everyone else involved in the legislative process. So why should you care about fiscal notes? So they are important because they inform legislative decisions that impact the UW. So if a bill passes, fiscal notes can be used to determine how much funding we will receive for a particular initiative. So they can have a direct impact on our state appropriations. We need to be responsive and accurate because if we don't respond, the legislature might assume that the bill doesn't impact us. And if a bill does have costs associated with it, the legislators won't know to amend the bill in a way that either mitigates that cost um, or to provide funds to offset the fiscal impact for us. We also just wanna maintain our credibility down in Olympia. So if one fiscal note is way off base, the legislature might not take further submissions and cost estimates seriously, and we don't want that. So the tricky part. We usually have less than 72 hours between the time that we get a fiscal note request from Olympia and the time we need to respond. The UW is also engaged in a huge variety of activities and programs, so fiscal note requests cover a similarly large variety of topics. Uh, we get fiscal note requests on everything from shellfish aquaculture to interest arbitration for uniformed personnel. We in OPB, we try to be super familiar with as many UW relevant topics as possible, but we definitely need your expertise. So we need your help to quickly prepare accurate fiscal notes. So the fiscal note process. So legislative staff requests a fiscal note for a given bill and OFM assigns it to relevant agencies. I receive the request, assign it to one of our analysts on the team and the analyst starts analyzing the bill and figuring out which one of you to contact. The assigned analyst reaches out to assessors with due date, bill information, and usually some initial thoughts in the email or maybe the beginnings of a draft for you to respond to. From there, you all, the assessors, coordinate with each other, uh, like with the other people on the email or in your department, and then loop in anyone else who needs to be included, start drafting up a narrative and calculations, and then send it back to your OBB analyst. Usually at that point, there's some back and forth about details, assumptions, inconsistencies, et cetera, between the analyst and the assessors. And because that can take some time, the earlier that we start that process, that back and forth, the better. Uh, there may also be conversations with other agencies, like the other agencies on the fiscal note or other higher education institutions so that we're all in alignment. Once the fiscal note narrative and calculations are finalized, the OPB analyst puts it into the OFM system, after which I review it to look for any errors or any points of confusion, trying to sort of think about it from an Olympia standpoint, and we submit it to OFM. At that point, OFM reviews the fiscal note, distributes it back to the legislators and staff who requested it. We may get a revision request at that point if it's really different from what the other institutions did or if they disagree about our assumptions. 
Um, which is why at this point, the other higher eds and us do so much work to try to get alignment before we submit anything. So on your end, how to respond to a fiscal note request. So you'll receive an email from one of us. When you do, please note the due date and then respond to let us know that you're on it. It soothes our soul to just know that you've at least received our email and are like working on it. So from there, read the bill. We talked earlier about how to access the bill text and what to look for with Lauren. You'll wanna coordinate with the other people on the email and loop in anyone else who you think might need to be involved. And then you'll be receiving a Word doc for the narrative portion and an Excel file for the tables from us. Please pay attention to both of those as both the narrative and the numbers are important for completing the fiscal note. Fill out those templates we sent you as thoroughly and accurately as possible. And then email those and any additional backup calculations or documentation or conversations back to your fiscal note analyst who sent you the initial bill um, or sent you the initial fiscal note request by the morning that it's due or sooner if possible. Sooner is always nice. So our fiscal note responses always include a summary which provides an overview of how the bill impacts the UW. If the bill is no impact, then we only need a, need a summary saying what the bill does and then why it doesn't impact us or maybe we're already doing what it's asking us to do. If there is an impact, you'll need to fill out one or more of the following additional impact narratives and tables. Cash receipts, um, it's typically only relevant to bills regarding the collection of a tax or fee. For UW, that's things like tuition or library fees. So this tends to be on our more student focused uh, fiscal notes. Expenditures, the most common one, uh, it's the cost to implement a bill. So here in the narrative, you'll wanna include all assumptions made in your estimates and show your work as much as possible. OFM needs to be able to duplicate our work and understand why we calculated things the way that we did. You'll wanna call out workload and cost drivers. Uh, so why does the bill cost money? What's driving that cost? Is it the need for upgraded software, additional personnel, travel costs and time to attend a work group? whatever else. Within your expenditures, you'll include information about the additional FTE that you need. So this is where you would indicate if additional staff time would be required to implement the bill. In the narrative, this will go in the expenditures section. In the tables and in the OFM system, FTEs are broken out in two different ways. So the hours and time needed, like 0.2 FTE in FY23, and the cost of that time. So we need a list of the FTE that would be needed, including their title, salary, and amount of FTE per year, and then the cost of that additional staff time, their salaries and benefits, is shown in the expenditure section. There's also a capital section. This isn't super common. If you are not sure about whether something should go in operating or capital, please talk with us. Um, but capital FTEs and expenditures are reported in the same manner that we do the operating costs. There's uh, there are some few, a few different ways that you have to break that down and that'll be included in the Excel file. So this is sort of what your narrative will look like. So it will include a summary, a brief overview of the bill's impact on the UW. This is usually super short, like a few sentences long. If it's a really complicated or long bill, sometimes it'll be you know, a sentence overall about what the bill does and then maybe a sentence per section that impacts the UW. But generally we wanna keep the summary super brief. Um, on future fiscal notes, on like substitutes, second substitutes, et cetera, uh, you'll also want to describe how this bill is different from the previous version. So then your expenditure section, which is your main section, it'll include a section by section narrative of the cost drivers, as well as the total impact per fiscal year, per fiscal year down at the bottom. It explains the calculations, oh, explains the calculations on the next slide so that our numbers and our logic make sense to OFM. So we basically want our numbers and our words to match well. So this is what the Excel file that you'll receive will look like. So as you can see here, we have uh, to break expenditures out by object code. In the Excel file, each of those objects has a comment with further explanation for what it is. But if you're at all unsure about what a, where a cost should go, um, please ask your analyst. This fiscal note example was from a bill that required a UW director slash professor to attend a working group in Olympia. This required a small amount of FTE, as you'll see down at the bottom, 0.02 FTE per year, which resulted in 2% of their annual salary, 2% of their yearly faculty benefits amount, and then some travel costs to and from Olympia. If, for example, they had needed to also buy some materials for those meetings, they would also have goods and services costs as well. Uh, for, for bills that we're seeing now with that, 
it's a little unclear about whether those meetings will be in person in Olympia or somewhere else, or if they'll be over Zoom. So we'll usually try to get some lead agency assumptions or come to some sort of agreement before we submit. And note this example is from last biennium. This year's fiscal notes will uh, include fiscal year 22 through fiscal year 27. So the most, most common question we get is what to do if there are too many unknowns. So you can do an indeterminate fiscal note, but I like to think of indeterminate fiscal notes as a last resort. OFM would generally prefer that we do determinate fiscal notes and give a range or scalable options, listing out how different assumptions would lead to different estimates and choosing what we think is the most likely outcome. If we still can't guess that, and there's just no way to predict or know the outcome at this time, then an indeterminate fiscal note that explains why the impact is indeterminate and gives some estimates and ranges or scenarios is our best bet. Uh, we wanna try to use indeterminate fiscal notes very sparingly uh, as OFM did an analysis and found that indeterminate fiscal notes are less likely to be funded since they don't have any idea how much money to potentially give us, they give us nothing. Uh, so nowadays we can include the determinant aspects of an indeterminate fiscal note in the table. This is not true from a few years ago, but is a recent thing as of I think last year. Um, so for example, if we don't know the volume of patients that would be impacted by a proposed healthcare policy bill, but we do know that we need 20 hours to attend a work group three times per year to work on this policy, uh, we can give scalable possibilities for the patient volume impact in the narrative and then put the known work group costs, work group costs in the narrative and the table. Um, I think the downside of that is that then we'll get, we're setting ourselves to potentially only get funding for just that determinant piece but that's the struggle with ones where we just don't have enough information. So as a general reminder, remember in general that you don't have to be super precise. We just want you to give us your best estimate. We know you can't predict the future, let alone in under 72 hours. So we just need our best logical guesstimates and reasonable roadmap of a bill's fiscal impact. So some overall tips and reminders. So fiscal notes take priority over general bill analysis. So if you get a, a reminder from LobbyGov or you get an email from us about a bill for your general analysis in LobbyGov and you also get a fiscal note on that bill, you'll wanna prioritize the fiscal note um, because of that super short timeline that we have. So like I said, please respond as soon as possible just to let us know that you received it. Uh, loop in others as needed. So that could be other units, other people in your department or Buffalo and Tacoma campuses. Like we just talked about, avoid indeterminate responses when possible and explain why if no impact. You also wanna write for a general audience. So that means avoiding jargon and always spelling out acronyms the first time you use them. And identify and explain all assumptions. So your calculations need to be repeatable and your logic clear. We want to report the bill's incremental impact over current law, so only new costs and impacts. Identify costs and receipts as one time or ongoing. And we want to do that in current dollars and we cannot include inflation, even though we know that of course inflation does exist, but regardless, we're not allowed to include it in fiscal notes. Uh, you'll also wanna consider implementation dates. So what fiscal years are affected since we have to put the costs and the FTE in by fiscal year in the system. And for additional staff time, we need the title of the person or the people, full-time annual salary, their benefits rate or classification, and the FTE or hours needed per year so that we can do those calculations. And remember, we just need estimates and your best guesses. And sort of lastly, a reminder that these are not a request, nor are they a guarantee of funding. I think good fiscal notes is our best way to sort of set ourselves up for success in trying to get state funding for things that we know will cost the university money. But of course, it's not a guarantee as much as we'd like it to be. So for additional resources, you can go to our, um, our OPB website and under state operations, you'll find a fiscal note tab. Uh, it'll have a copy of this fiscal note presentation and a full fiscal note example. And there's also tips for responding to fiscal note requests, including the list of reminders that was on our last slide. And lastly, any questions? Uh, go ahead, Tina, and then I have a question in the chat. Um, so my question is how to deal with fiscal notes when it's not necessarily that there's going to be a, a cost that we're going to have to lay out to do it, but there's going to be a cost in terms of decreased revenue to the institution. Again, using the fabulous example of that residency. 
uh, bill that came through last time. Um, how do we how do we record that in the fiscal notes? So we would record that as a negative cash receipt since that's revenue that we will not be receiving because of that. And we we do want to try to calculate that as best we can. I know sometimes with some of those, we don't know how many students exactly. If right. we can give like a range, that's helpful or sort of a guesstimate that we can put in the table. I think that's nice. Um, but it would be a negative cash receipt for a loss of revenue. Okay. Yeah, and I believe we did do that in that fiscal note. We kind of had a like for every student granted residency, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, that's where we would put that. Yeah. Uh, the question in the chat is, how is it determined who should assess a bill's financial impact, i.e. which units are invited to collaborate on or contribute to a fiscal note? That's a great question. So it's our job to try to figure out who and who needs to respond to a bill and, and what areas of the university might be affected by a bill. Uh, Part of our job, we do our best to do that, but this is a big institution with a lot of activity. Um, and so we need your help, as Kelsey said in a couple slides ago, loop in any folks that you think might uh, be affected. If you if you need to consult with another um, department uh, on a fiscal note, please just let us know, loop them in. Uh, if we send you a bill request to give us analysis on a bill, but you know that it affects another, another unit as well, let us know. That's really helpful and, and we really need that. So thank you. Yeah, I would just say from the process standpoint, usually we'll use whoever's in LobbyGov if, if we've already been sent the bill or we've already sent it out to people. Um, so like Jed said, that's a good time if we send you a bill for analysis to let us know so that we can add more people to LobbyGov, which will set us up for adding more people to the original fiscal note email. For fiscal notes that we don't have in LobbyGov yet, we'll do the same sort of process that we did, would if we were going to send it out for bill review, which is looking at like who's done bills previously in this similar area, who's done fiscal notes in this similar area, and then do our best guess. And then, like Jed said, please loop in others because we don't know all the expertise that you do. Anything else? All right. Now that we've uh, covered those essential updates, here's a bit of an outlook on what we're expecting to see this session. Uh, so this is an even numbered year. So it's a short session that is scheduled to last 60 days from January 10th through to March 10th. Uh, there's a possibility of one or more special sessions. We haven't had one of those in a while. So everybody please knock on wood for me. Um, hopefully we won't have one. Uh, supplemental budgets are usually our opportunity to course correct uh, based on changing revenue forecasts, cash flows, caseloads, things like that. Uh, this year is a little bit different because of uh, COVID. There, you know, we expected significant impacts on the biennial budget. The biennial budget passed last year didn't include uh, wage increases for most state employees, uh, especially in the second year. Um, so it didn't look like a typical biennial budget in some ways. So I think this supplemental budget might look a little bit more like a, a typical biennial budget. Bill introductions will uh, start with a numerical progression from the end of the 2021 session. So bills that were introduced last year and didn't pass are still eligible for consideration. Uh, we affectionately call those zombie bills when they come back alive. But uh, if you already have assessments in LobbyGov for those bills, um, if it's the same version, we, we probably won't reach out to you unless there's a hearing or, or changes to the bill, but um, watch out for those as well. And those should still be in your lobby gov. If you um, are new and there were bills that your department was tracking last year and you need to be added to bills that we're currently tracking, let us know and we can we can make sure that that happens if, if things start moving. The uh, Economic and Revenue Forecast Council released their November revenue forecast a couple months ago. Uh, that forecast increased general fund uh, revenue totals in the current biennium by over a billion dollars ahead of the session, and that was in addition to increases in uh, previous forecasts. So the total state fund balance for the biennium is now projected to be about $5 billion, so that's uh, great news. Uh, but since there uh, wasn't kind of a, a lot of compensation items in the original biennial budget, you know, that can be eaten up pretty quickly by, by salary increases. Governor Inslee's supplemental operating budget and uh, capital budget proposals were released in mid-December. Uh, and based on the November forecast, we have a full OPB brief on our website. Check that out if you haven't already. 
at a high level, the proposed budget would authorize a 3% wage increase for most UW employees in FY23. Uh, importantly, the funding split between state funding and assumed incremental tuition revenue in the governor's budget would be improved to a 50-50 split uh, between state funding and tuition. So uh, that's great news. That was an integral part of our request and really important for our ability to afford those adjustments. So that was good to see. Uh, the governor's budget would also fully fund all of the university's supplemental budget requests on the operating side, which Joe will summarize later. And then in, in addition to that, the governor uh, proposed adding two new items, one for clean energy research and one to prepare K-12 students for future careers in medicine. So those were two ads from him. And then on the capital side, the governor's supplemental capital budget would uh, backfill funding for seismic improvements that needed to be diverted for critical repairs at the UW power plant, which was a request that we made last year. Uh, and it would also provide additional capital funding for clean energy research facilities to kind of uh, pair with the operating appropriation. So as a quick reminder, leadership in the House and Senate will release their own budget proposals over the course of session. We'll, uh, We'll uh, review those budgets as they're released and, and uh, post budget briefs for all major budget proposals uh, that we see and then the compromise budget uh, at the first link there, the briefs page. And our brief for the governor's budget is already posted, as I mentioned. And then we also have the OPB blog um, for budget proposals, revenue forecasts, and other updates. Um, and you will for sure receive session related emails from us as well that we would appreciate your quick response to. So that is it for me and I'll pass it off to Joe for the main event unless there's any questions for me. Take it away. All right. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to live up to the main event billing, but I'll do my best. Um, I'm Joe Dack. I'm the um, State Relations Director. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, first, want to acknowledge uh, Morgan Hickel and Maggie Hughes, who are uh, the other members of our team, for their good work, and, and thanks to OPB and everybody on the call uh, for helping us do our jobs um, well and represent the university well down in Olympia. It's absolutely critical that um, we get folks to participate, and so um, thanks for being here today, but more importantly, thanks for uh, everyone taking the time. I know everybody's got, you know, other jobs that they actually have to do and um, your input on these bills is absolutely critical. So um, getting that quick feedback to us is um, helps us be successful and I think it helps make uh, better legislation and obviously um, reduces negative impacts on the university. So thank you for that. Um, so just in general, just some some friendly reminders. Uh, we get a lot of questions about can I do this thing? Can I do that thing? I'm unclear if I can, you know, talk to this person or not. Um, this is the slide for you. Um, one of the questions we always get is, uh, you know, can I, can I, you know, act as a citizen even though I work at the UW? Can I, you know, weigh in on a bill that I care about even if it doesn't impact the UW? The answer is yes. You just need to make sure that you're doing it with your Yahoo, Google, AOL, whatever private email account you have on your own time from your own computer. Um, or phone or however you do that. Um, you can also, um, we want you to, you know, educate elected officials and state government about, um, about issues that, you know, we have so many experts uh, on a whole range of issues here at the university. That's part of our mission to get that information to policymakers and staff. So yes, we, we would like you to do that. Just coordinate with us and we can help you uh, be successful. A lot of times we get um, requests for information on things that are happening at the UW or things that um, you know perhaps faculty or staff are, are working on in terms of research or other other items, um, and we want to make sure that again legislators get that information. You can uh, lobby an elected official. You just need to make sure that you report it, and you've probably gotten an email here in the last couple of days from Maggie on our team about making sure that uh, we are compliant with state law and uh, reporting all those uh, all those meetings and contacts with legislators. Um, you can also uh, do it using your UW affiliation. Um, if, you're, um, if you're explicitly speaking for yourself and not on, on behalf of the university, again, just need to report it. And that you know, quadruple starred uh, bullet at the end of that slide of just work with us. Um, I, I, I promise you, we, we will help you be more successful uh, in, in your communication. Um, so please just let us know. And it also helps 
um, reduce surprises for us because a lot of times uh, um, someone will have a conversation with a staff, staff or a legislator and they'll just expect that the state relations team knows about it. And so I think it's just better that we all sort of share information so we can be successful down in that uh, down in the session. So next slide, please. Um, things that, that you can't do, um, grassroots lobbying uh, as a UW employee. So grassroots lobbying, um, an example of that would be um, getting sending an email on your UW account to everybody that works in your department that they should all contact their legislator about House Bill 1000 because it's the most important thing or the worst thing to ever happen in the state of Washington. That is explicitly um, uh, prohibited under state ethics law. Um, there, there are some different versions of grassroots lobbying. Um, what I would say is that if you have a question, if, you, if it feels like you're coming up against the line, um, just call us and ask us. Um, and, and we are not the end all be all experts, but we have gotten many, many questions and have dealt with a number of situations. Um, and so just give us a call uh, and we're happy to talk through with you on that. Um, you cannot participate in political campaigns, obviously during work hours. Um, or work to pass or defeat a ballot initiative using UW resources. I would just, again, when in doubt, if it feels like it's not really work related, just use your personal email on your personal time on your personal device. Um, a lot, many of you will, um, we, either we or someone else will ask you to participate in a meeting with legislators. This list looked a little bit differently and in areas of, of pre-COVID. Um, but now one of the main things to do is make sure that your Wi-Fi is stable and that your computer works. If we have a meeting um, at 12.15 and you're getting on at 12.14 and your internet doesn't work or your camera doesn't work, um, you're probably gonna miss the meeting because the meetings are quick. They don't have, legislators do not have a lot of time. Um, so please be on, be early, be ready to go. The thing I would say is, um, again, acknowledging that a lot of times we only have 10 or 15 minutes with legislators and they usually wanna talk for some of that. We've got to get our points across quickly um, and be concise, um, be flexible. Uh, the schedule is going to change all the time. Oftentimes committees go long, floor session goes long, their previous meetings go long. And so to the best you can just be flexible. Um, this kind of goes without saying, but be gracious. We, we work really hard to not disparage any other institutions, uh, really anything, try to be above board and be uh, positive and promote and just represent the university and only the university and not speak on others behalf. Um, use concrete examples. I mean, I think particularly in public testimony, if you're testifying on a bill in a hearing, um, I always try to remind folks, just talk like a regular person because you are talking to regular people. Um, you don't have to memorize a speech. You also don't have to read a speech, but um, just try and give examples of somebody, you know, if you're talking to a friend trying to explain the issue, that is the most compelling testimony. And a lot of times you'll get asked questions and testimony. And if you don't know the answer, you can say, I don't know the answer, but we'll follow up and we can help you get information to legislators and staff after the fact. We have all their emails. We know how to get a hold of the right people. Um, so please just, you know, say, hey, I, let me get, I, I need to get back to you on that. And that happens all the time. So for our agenda, um, for the supplemental session, um, you know, in general, uh, uh, Jed mentioned some of these things, but just to sort of give you a landscape, um, as of earlier this week, I, uh, my anticipation is that the session will be almost entirely remote. I think given the emergence of the Omicron variant, um, th there is a chance that they do some uh, floor action uh, in person later in the session, but I have a hard time believing that um, from the from the perspective of the public who would be, you know, accessing meetings, there's not going to be much, if any, in person interaction with legislators and staff in Olympia. Um, it's going to look like this. Um, and thankfully, we had a year to practice it a long budget session last year to practice it. So I think we've, we've got it down. It doesn't mean that it doesn't bring challenges and it's different and um, certainly I would prefer an in-person session, but given everything that's happening, that's, that's where we're at. Um, the, the Democrats still control uh, Olympia. Um, they've got sizable majorities in both chambers. Um, they now have 
uh, all the statewide elected offices. So they are setting the agenda in Olympia. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that um, the Republican the minority party in both chambers doesn't, doesn't matter and can't impact policy. But at the end of the day, um, the agenda and the calendars and all those types of things and what gets heard and doesn't heard and goes to the floor will be decided by, uh, by the Democrats. We have some new faces uh, in Olympia already. Um, just since the last session, two new two new senators and a new uh, and a new rep. Um, I anticipate we will have a lot more of those uh, as we have this presentation next year. We've already had uh, a number of legislators that have indicated that they're not going to run for re-election. That this session will be their last, and so this is pretty typical in Olympia to have a lot of turnover. But I think this year especially is going to be. Um, Pretty significant. So uh, always, always more education to do. Um, the the big legislative topics. I uh, you know obviously they've got to pass a, you know a supplemental capital budget and operating budget. Um, our public health, of course, given what's happening uh, in in the world, um, a lot of folks have been watching this long term care act. Uh, they will almost certainly pass some reforms to that law. I think that's going to be one of the first bills that gets out of Olympia. I've heard that um, they're gonna try and get something out in the first couple of weeks. So we'll know pretty soon what changes get made to that program. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, there's a possibility of a transportation package, some of the other issues that are mentioned on this slide, but um, on the higher ed side, I think you'll still see um, renewed focus on um, financial aid programs, expansion of financial aid programs, um, dual credit, um, and, a, and a number of other issues. If you look at, if you are savvy enough to look at those pre-filed bills that are on the legislative website, you can see all those topics uh, represented in those. So for the proactive work that we'll do, um, you know, we heard from our OPB friends this morning about, about the reactive work in terms of responding to bill proposals. For the proactive work, our number one priority set forth by the president and provost is compensation and making sure that um, that we can get uh, that we can get our uh, proposed uh, salary increases of both approved and funded appropriately. Um, the other priorities I'll mention on here, and I'm happy to go in greater detail on any of these. Um, we got uh, two million dollars ongoing per year uh, to expand uh, enrollments at the Allen School. Um, we would our original proposal to get an additional 100 per year uh, degrees per year actually cost uh, $4 million a year. So we're gonna try and get an additional $2 million a year uh, in, in the budget. Um, we've worked with, uh, in the second bullet, we've worked with the College of Pharmacy at WSU, um, our School of Pharmacy, our, our deans have gotten together and put together a proposal to create two new uh, behavioral health pharmacy residency programs. Our two slots will be housed at the new behavioral health teaching facility at, at uh, UWMC Northwest. Um, and the WSU slots will be in central and eastern Washington. So a good partnership there, um, trying to, to, to help um, uh, uh, move forward the behavioral health workforce crisis in this state. Next slide, please. Um, the other items, um, that first bullet is, is trying to bring some of the expertise uh, of IHME to Spokane and uh, eastern Washington and rural parts of the Washington. This is sort of a, a pilot project, so to speak, uh, to bring more uh, of their research uh, here domestically in the state. They've obviously done a lot of great work around the world, but I'm trying to sort of do, localize some of that work. Uh, and then um, we got funds, capital funds in the biennial budget for Milgard Hall, uh, the new new building at UW Tacoma, which is already going up. I've seen some of those pictures and it looks great. Um, we need now need the state to come through with uh, funds to operate that building in long term. So that that is that um, final bullet there. On the capital budget, Jed mentioned uh, $10 million for um, critical deferred maintenance um, work that we had planned in the in the previous year, but had to um, sort of delay given some other emergent issues that were happening on campus. So um, that is our, our, our primary capital budget ask uh, for the session. Um, so I'll just underscore some of the points that uh, our friends at OPV made, you know, timely analysis on these bills is, is hugely helpful. Um, a lot of times we only get a couple of days, sometimes 24 hours before uh, a bill is, is scheduled for a public hearing. And so we're scrambling because a lot of times uh, we need to get say something publicly and we generally like those comments and feedback to be informed with uh, experts on campus. Same, same with fiscal notes. Um, you know, just 
if one thing I will mention is that um, if you have a question on a bill or you, you know, at six o'clock at night, you think, wait a minute, th this is a huge problem and the hearings tomorrow, please reach out to us. Um, unfortunately, I am glued to my cell phone and email during session, which means I will respond to you, particularly if it's if it's an urgent issue. Um, and I would ask, and we will try not to abuse this, if we're working with you on a really complex bill, um, <clears throat> particularly if the hearing is uh, happening soon or the executive session is happening soon, to the extent you can be available so we can get it solved, um, we very much appreciate that. Um, if I am unavailable, uh, Morgan and Maggie on our team are also very good at responding to text, emails, and calls, particularly during the legislative session. Um, and again, if you are planning to do some work with legislators and staff in Olympia, you don't need our permission, but please just let us know. It helps everybody be more successful. That's my, my final plea to you all. So um, I think that's my last slide, unless there are questions, um, we'll take it from there. All right, now's the time for any questions. I don't have anything in the chat. Anybody gonna break the ice? Do I need Jeopardy music? There we go, Dan. Thank you. What do you have? Um, just curious about the capital budget. We had a request for uh, Anderson Hall renovation last year, and I'm curious about um, what, whether and when that might go forward. Well, I, Jed, I don't want to speak for you all, but I think that'll be certainly under consideration for the next um, for the next uh, biennial session. Um, I think the you know, I, I, again, I won't speak for the president and the provost. There was a, a deliberation. The short answer is that the capital budget is going to be pretty darn small this year. Um, what I've heard is that from legislative leaders is that it's could be only between, you know, 70, 80, 90 million. And so to sort of request a, a third of that um, is just not realistic. And so I think um, there was a decision to sort of delay it, do some more work internally and come back uh, hopefully next year. Yeah, and going into this request, our sense was that the capital budget was going to be exceedingly small. So that was a big, big reason why we were very careful about having a small request. Thanks. Somebody asked about, um, where to find more information about setting a bill, a suggested bill priority or position. There is a document on our uh, bill tracking page that Laura mentioned that uh, has some good guidelines on kind of how to set that. We'll look at the totality of assessments on a bill and kind of make a judgment call in a, in a call with state relations uh, to determine kind of our final position priority, but those are really helpful from you all to kind of help us set that. Okay, I'll ask a question just to ask the question. So I noticed one of the proposed bills deals with uh, the residents and the fellows in terms of their collective bargaining unit. And it, it even talks about um, what hours will be required to meet with him to bargain. I'm just wondering, does anybody know the backdrop for who proposed that bill and what it's about? Um, is that you, Shelley? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Go ahead, Joe. Um, I have a meeting about I, I have a meeting about that with the sponsor tomorrow. So I will know oh. a lot more uh, tomorrow afternoon. So stay tuned. Okay. Well, if you have any backdrop of if you want any background from me, since I've been involved with bargaining in that, um, in addition to you might want to reach out to labor relations. That might and I, I think there's a conversation happening in about two hours with uh, banks and others uh, to get smart on this issue. So oh. Okay, 
I don't see any other questions in the comments. There were a couple direct messages to me. So if you sent me something and I don't see it, please speak up. All right. Just a reminder, we have the Q&A session next Friday at one. So if you uh, want to join that, please do. Here's a, this guy just jumped into my lap. So make an appearance. Um, thank you all for your time this morning and uh, we'll look forward to working with you and, and thanks in advance for all your help. Thank you everyone, appreciate it. Thank you.